Here we go. And we are live. It's Friday nights here. Uh, guess where I am? I'm at home. I'm going to be here for a while. I've been here for a while already. And so it goes. It's life under COVID-19. Quarantine Con Carne, sponsored by C&H Financial Services. As business owners continue to open back up to serve their communities, they're faced with a lot of challenges as they navigate through the new normal brought on by the coronavirus. C&H Financial Services is here to help. They offer a variety of products that range from traditional merchant accounts to a zero-cost payment processing solution, which eliminates the expense associated with accepting Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express as a form of customer payment. C&H Financial Services ETAB solutions, easy to set up for your business for online ordering and curbside pickup. CNH also offers cost-effective commercial lending programs, which can help you get your business the money it needs to make it through these unprecedented, dare I say, dystopian times. To learn more, contact CNH Financial Services at 855-600-2437 or go to chfs.us. And here we are, my guest tonight. He is an award-winning comic book, newspaper strip, and children's book writer and illustrator. He is Dan Doherty, uh, returning to the podcast after... Three years. It was three years ago this month, Dan Doherty, that you were last on my podcast. Wow. Really? This wow. month. Yeah. We're, we're celebrating an anniversary together. Three, your part. three years ago, you were in my car performing. See, you, you, you've got both sides of your brain working. Or actually, it's the same side, just different things. You're a musician. You are a, a, an illustrator. You engage both those processes in my car last time you you busted out a drawing you were just like sketching in the car you performed in the car you performed a song called payday back yep. then back 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 when it was so difficult to earn an honest wage in 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 the world back you remember those days yeah those really troubled times we had there now things were easier <laughs> things were so hard in 2017 oh my god oh. O omg uh, i want to mention dan doherty speaking of music the new album is called Bad Ideas, Dan Doherty, available for streaming and on vinyl, on handsome vinyl, no less. Uh, and look, there we go. There's that illustrating, illustrating yep. site. This kind of Lovecraftian thing going on in here. It's my octopus. <laughs> it is. Oh, yeah, right. Because it's an octopus that plays rock. Yeah. Multi-instrumentalist. Multi <laughs> so, <laughs> so the question, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about your album, Bad Ideas. Sure. What, what are you writing in on the cover? What is this? Uh, it is an amazing uh, uh, robotic experiment. Um, so this is really funny. I love this story. We were we were struggling to come up with some imagery for not only the, the cover of the album, but also for just some promotional flyers at the time. Because we just started playing gigs and hitting the city, hitting a, a couple of states around here, touring. And um, and we were sitting uh, outside of my, my drummer and the, the, the guy in the, uh, in the left picture um brett figura he um he he is a he's got in the red pants he's a, a wonderful musician very talented artist too and we were just sitting there trying to figure out like what are we gonna do for this we have no idea and it was so funny because we were struggling to do this it felt like one of my comic strips because as we were doing this a a couch on wheels rolled past uh on the street uh it was their neighbors uh the, the shimmick family who um who are like robotic engineer people, like they're they're friends with Brett and they build all this weird and wonderful stuff. So they built a couch that was capable of going, I think it was like 15 miles an hour. Um, it had an engine underneath the seat. It had, you know, obviously wheels and um, even a remote control so you could steer it. And it had this big um, banner up top uh, which you can see in the picture yeah. too, uh, which was a, for their, I believe it was for their school. I think it was for Lincoln Way. Um, this is in New Lenox, by the way. So this is in a, a south suburb of Chicago. And we, I was like, we didn't even, we didn't even acknowledge it at the time. It took us like a full day to realize why didn't we just ask those guys <laughs> to take a picture with us? So we asked them and they were very gracious and very nice. And um, we got the shot, like my, my sister-in-law, uh, Karen, uh, she took the, the photography and we just did it all in one quick shot. It was so much fun. It's really fun riding a couch at 15 miles an hour down the street. I mean, I can't tell you what, what, what more fun can you have? I am putting all my friends on notice right now. My friends don't invent anything cool. I want my, I want my friends to step up their games and create things like robotic couches that go 15 miles an hour. Yeah. All my friends, you're on notice. You're on blast. <laughs> And just as a point of reference, I, I, I referenced your illustration, your, your comics work. 
Uh, I still love the Beardo strips. These, these are so funny. I like it, it is impossible to read these and not see ourselves in your life that you threw uh, threw on here in cartoon form. I love this stuff. Thanks. And then, and then uh, the very creepy touching evil. Yep. You have the I, special copy too. You got the the limited edition version with the silver foil. Oh, is this limited? Yeah. Me. That's the fancy one. Yeah. I mean, look at how badass that, hang on, this is just, <laughs> th this is the great thing about being able to do a podcast with a video component. Just, I mean, this is like horror and crime. It just, this doesn't even, it doesn't even do it justice. Touching Evil, great stuff from Dan Doherty. It's funny, I, I was looking at the Dan Doherty website and it said, I'm guessing you put this on the website a long time ago. 2020 is going to be a wild year. Join in on the fun. Yeah. Was that something you did in like January or February? I did it. I know exactly when I did it. It was after my last show of the year. Uh, we had a vinyl release show in Joliet. Uh, really great show. Had a blast. I, I was so looking forward to what the year would bring because I we come off the album. I know that. Yeah. Let me just set this up so that it really <laughs> stings at the end. Uh -huh. But we, we, I had a I had like at one point on the stage I had seven musicians uh, and we were just just shredding through the album and then all my favorite other songs that i've ever written in my time as a as a songwriter and then a bunch of covers that we really liked and we just had a great night and i remember i think right after that i and that would have been i believe it was february 7th was the show and and so i didn't know what was coming and i think i posted that i have not updated that I really should. no 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 leave it up i think the irony is is, is rich is it perfect it what is one of the pictures in it is from that show. Like, so you can see me like all happy and innocent in a simpler time. Like, hey, this is gonna be a great year. I'm gonna tour and play a bunch of shows <laughs> to promote this solo album, which I really poured my heart into. And then, <laughs> and then the world was like, hmm. Let's... It's gonna be a wild year. Join in the fun. Yeah. He, he if, said... you, if you do any kind of touching up to it, maybe just a picture of you getting kicked square in the nuts. <laughs> Just, yep. <laughs> just doubled over just bam there there's your 2020 I, right there i have this you're actually right i have this ongoing joke i, I draw i still draw beardo and i i have um this uh character that i came up with in it that is obviously a fictional character but it's how i feel about the whole year and it's um it's baby new year so and baby new year 2020 is a an alcoholic uh very surly and, and out of control baby who we are all we are all baby new year 2020 yeah and like all the father times before him all of the ones that are like you know like the, the years past are like should we i know he's a baby but should we like stop him <laughs> like because he's out of control and and that's been my running gag all year to keep myself sane is that baby new year did it like baby new year has a broken bottle and he's like swinging it wildly at everybody and he's coughing a lot. He's just, he's a mess. And, and that's 2020 for you. Speaking of Beardo, am I crazy? I thought that Beardo was, was going to be retired at some point. Yes, you are right. You are crazy and it was retired. <laughs> but, but, but you're back to doing Beardo, which I'm thrilled about. Um, yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, so here's, here's what happened with that um, for me. When I finished the strip, I finished it earlier than people realized. I think I finished it in about 2016. I had done a whole bunch of advanced work um, to make the fifth and what I at the time thought was going to be the final volume. Um, cut to 2017 and somewhere around like, I think it was August of that year, I officially announced I was retiring the strip. And a lot of that had to do with just you know, a lot of other really good opportunities were coming along and comic strips are a really tough business. And I felt like I said a lot in, in the, in the Beardo strip in five volumes. So I was like, well, maybe, you know, maybe this is a good time to, to bow out. What I didn't realize when I ended it was that I was going to gain more followers by ending it than I ever had by starting it. I, I got an absurd amount of, of love from the last strip, which like hit the Huffington Post and hit, um, um, a lot of a lot of parent websites and board panda like did a feature on it and read it all these all these places i didn't even think about were just like it must have it must have seen millions and millions of people the final strip it was bizarre i 
it's a comic strip and it was 2017 like there it's a tough market in general yeah. so to crack that egg and actually resonate i had all of a sudden this whole new fan base and i also realized too one other thing um i had never put my son in the strip um my son was born about two months well about a month later and the ending of the series is about just my daughter and me and being a father and everything and everything that goes with it how time doesn't really um slow down for you when you care about things it moves faster and uh so i felt really bad because i'm like i had this really great ending about and the book is about me it's about my family and it doesn't include one very important part of it so uh cut to 2020 because i kept thinking you know one day i'll bring it back and i'll let my son be a part of it and i'll i'll tell some of his fun you know kid adventures and have fun with it just you know just do it someday right yeah well <laughs> uh you know how people were saying like when the coronavirus hit like you know, this is the opportunity to do that one thing you've always been meaning to do and you just didn't have time for. I took that seriously and I was like, uh, I've been really meaning to put my son in and, and have one last hurrah with Beardo with him in there. So uh, I think it was uh, late March, early April. I just, I started up a, uh, like a Patreon site, real simple, nothing, no, nothing fancy. It was just two bucks to, a month to get in. Cause I don't have newspapers anymore and right. I don't, you know, it, it's a different world than it was when I was first doing it. Um, and I was just like, here, look, I want to do this thing. If you want to support fantastic. I just want to make something that I've always wanted to make since I ended it. And, uh, and that's, that's why it's back. I mean, it'll end again at some point, but I wanted to make sure that my whole family was represented. I love it. And again, yeah. I see myself reflected because this is, this is very you. I mean, you're very funny and the ability to, approach a strip a three four four panel strip and to tell a story in that time and get to a punchline I, I think is an incredible skill set to be that to use brevity to tell stories like this i i love it uh but also it's not like approaching beardo is it, it's different from writing a lovecraftian horror piece which you don't but this is you can draw from your life experience I and mean, the you'll never have a shortage of content i would imagine yeah, yeah exactly I, that, that, that was the one thing i didn't have a problem with you know I, I felt like if you're doing something autobiographical you know if, if you can't come up with something interesting maybe you should take a look at yourself a little bit harder because it, it felt like life was all there and i my my problem honestly even now there's so many interesting things to talk about when you just keep it simple and keep it about what you what you know within your yeah. world and you know and i feel like that was another thing like beardo to me for me was a time capsule to not forget things like to not forget where i came from to not forget what i believe in to not forget my sense of humor because i i sometimes forget it and i get too serious and i don't want to be that guy <laughs> so for me like beardo has always been a way to have a reality check but i also realized too that it's entertainment so like i really like i really like telling funny jokes and making people laugh it makes me it makes me feel better you know i love that especially now. yeah especially now and i love that you've maintained a level of creative output during all this i talk about this a lot because there's not a whole lot else to talk about we're all stuck at home we're all sheltering in place and trying to navigate through the, the dystopian world we're in i i think it's a perfectly normal reaction when faced with all this to say, holy shit, this is scary, this is miserable, oh my god, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm upset. But for a creative, you, you almost have to find a way to bully your way through it. You almost have to find a way to be be innovative in spite of the shit show around you. And I, I think you're doing it. I mean, I, I think that's, it, it's not easy. I don't want to paint a picture that, oh, well, you're a creative guy, you just sit down in front of a drawing board. It's weird in this time, but you, you found a way to pull it off. Yeah, and I, I really understand, I appreciate the struggle too. Like I, I understand, I wanna make sure that people realize too that I, you know, I have been doing this my whole adult life. So there's certain things that I, I feel like I'm used to. Um, there was a joke that was made around like the, the start of this that like all of us hermit artists were like training our whole lives for this or something like that. Yeah. But, but really it's not, 
that simple. It's it's I feel for people who are very creative and are struggling right now, or people who want to express themselves and make some sense of the world and are struggling because I do too. Like I I just um I I feel like at this point I'm I'm, on, I'm 39. So like I've been doing I've been doing this professionally for like 16, 17 years now. And I'm I'm at a point where I'm like, I don't, I kind of, I'm a little addicted to it. Like I can't, you know, like if, if I'm, if I'm struggling as a person, um, my outlet is this stuff. So yeah. for me, it's like, that's, that's a, that's a nice feeling to have. At the same time, I know some people who are like dear friends of mine, very talented who, you know, this was a big blow. This is, this yeah. is a huge blow to all of us. And my, it doesn't change how I feel about like the world. I mean, I'm, I'm really like, I don't think I've been more in tune and more devastated by the world news than 2020. Like, I don't, oh, think of course. Ever, I don't think anyone's ever going to forget this year for better or for worse. I mean, it's just a little weird thing, but you know, again, like I, I'm, I feel grateful, like, you know, gratitude, something I keep having to, and I'm sure we all have to check it every now and then. I'm like, I have some outlet. I have something to do, and I can actually—it's my job. You know, it's like my, what, I, what I do every day. I, I need you before we talk about the new album um, again. Bad ideas. I, I need to ask you, what is Floppy Cop? Because I saw this and I thought, <laughs> well, Dan Doherty's gone insane. Uh, well, Floppy Cop is—it's uh, a really funny book. It's—it's it's, um, Floppy Cop is a comic that I, I for the first time wrote and did not draw. I, I wanted to collaborate with some friends. Um, my very talented uh, friend, Seth the Moose, is a co-creator on Bucky Cat. Uh, Seth is uh, an artist and a writer. Um, and I really wanted to work with him for a long time. We wanted to do something silly. So it's very much in the vein of like um, airplane or uh, I would say perhaps a more modern example would be like Archer or maybe Brooklyn Nine-Nine, um, where it's absurdism. Like it's it's ridiculous jokes. It's it's about this cop who is is a, a floppy cop. He bends back and forth. You know, he's, <laughs> he's a visual gag. Like he's really like you start off laughing because he's just absurd as a human being, and. The cast of characters around him are, are equally as absurd. Like his villains are absurd. It's very much tongue in cheek puns, gags, you know, like just trying to make you laugh and 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 um, with a, less of a filter than Beardo ever had. Beardo always had a filter of like, I'm doing this for newspapers. I'm doing this for all ages. I'm trying to make sure that it's resonating with everyone. Floppy Cop is definitely not that. And I feel really bad right now because we did a you know a full run of it we did a five issue series people loved it it was really well received as far as like critically and um, and fan wise and then i feel really bad now because i feel like it's got you know different resonance in this current climate we're trying to have a fun comic um and you know we're trying to figure out how to make sure that people realize that we're still having a fun comic with a very touchy subject you know? so um that being said i mean the, the, it's meant to be just as silly and absurd as like the naked gun. You know what I mean? Like it's, mm -hmm. it's in that spirit. Like I, I would, I wish that Leslie Nielsen was alive and younger to play floppy cop. That's the kind of humor we're going for. Like that, that kind of like punnery visual gags, absurdity. That's exactly what we're trying to do. And again, again, all, all to make ourselves laugh first. I mean, this, it was a book that is pre 2020 uh, we we're doing a sequel to it right now, um, but we kind of, that's a whole different story. We pushed it back because the distribution right now is the same due to everything. Yeah, right. Um, but, you know, I really hope when people get to read it that they, they see how hard we're trying to uh, remind them that it's okay to laugh and it's okay to have fun. Awesome. All right, let's talk about the album. Again, sure. bad ideas. Uh, handsome vinyl package here. I, I love it. This is this is rootsy. It, it rocks. It, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, I talked about how last time you were on three years ago this month, you, you played a song about not making enough money. 
I, yep. I feel like that, that's a theme that pops up again on this album. Yep. Making it ends is. meet. Hey, do you, can I can I loan you a couple bucks? I I, I worry about you. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm uh, I feel like you know you, you're right to what you know, and I've definitely known <laughs> many times. <laughs> I still, I mean, I'm I'm doing fine. You know, everything's okay. But I feel I don't know. I feel like that's just a subject that I always come back to in some way because. I just, a friend of mine and I always joke about how people say money can't buy happiness and we're like, I think it actually can in some sense. It's like, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't really agree with that sense. Like, I'm a happy person in my own self. I've learned, I'm, you know, like I said, like I'm not, I'm not like a young man saying this anymore. I feel like I'm like, you know, I'm about to be 40 and I'm like, I still feel those same feelings I felt when I was 20, but with more knowledge, like with more experience, you know? And um, and I think you're referring to the track, what, The Money is Better in Heaven? Uh, it's a song about the nine to five lifestyle. Yeah. You, yeah. You, say, you say, maybe I should have been a dancer. Yeah. I mean, it's that, that, I love that song. It's the, it's the closing track on the album. And it, um, it, this album, actually, if I can like, like give a little bit of context and then come back to what, you, what you're mentioning. Um, is sort of a mixed bag because it, it came at a point where I wasn't sure if I wanted to do music anymore. Like I was, I was, my, my, my previous band had broken up, um, you know, and, and it, it was just the way it goes, nothing terrible or, or awful. It was just, you know, bands break up and things happen, life goes on. But, you know, it left me kind of shook because I was like, how many more times am I going to do this? Because I kept thinking of it in the wrong way. I kept thinking of what success meant to me as like as if it had to be um some sort of recognition that i didn't have yet and which is interesting that, that sounds so different from what you were just talking about with floppy cop like you did your art stuff you do to amuse yourself first and it sounds right. like that's not that's not the approach you're taking with your music well that's well that's exactly what i had to remind myself of. you're you you hit the nail on the head because to me it was like I was, I think because I felt there's something called imposter syndrome that, mm -hmm. that people talk about, you know, where they feel like, you know, they've, they're a fraud or they haven't, they haven't done what, um, they haven't done the things that people think they've done. They're not as good as people might think they are, or they're not as good as they, they wanted to be at that point in their life or whatever. There's all this stuff that goes on with imposter syndrome. And I certainly felt that after my band broke up, I felt like maybe I had been, I had been fooling myself into thinking that I had something to contribute in the music world that, and again, also thinking that like, because I never had really exploded or had some wild thing, like that that meant that I wasn't a good musician or that I wasn't a good songwriter. And then I, uh, some time passed and I, I had a really good talk with a, a friend of mine, he's a, a musician, uh, songwriter, uh, named, uh, John Condon. Uh, he's a, he's a guy who gets the, the South suburb scene a lot. Um, and he gave me a really good reality check because he was like, you, you got to ask yourself a real good question. Like, why do you want to make music? Why do you do this? If it was to do all those, like, you know, having the big moment or having the, the, like the award or the other thing, you know, then you're going to be let down. But if you're doing it because you really had something to say and you really wanted to have fun with it, then do it. And I was, and I was still like on the fence and he was like, you sound like you have one more shot left in you at least, right? Why don't you try? And, and I and I said, but where am I going to record, John? He, 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 you know, he immediately said a mutual friend of ours, um, uh, Bill Aldridge, who runs Third City Sound in Toledo. Yeah, it's a really good place. And I knew I could go there and feel comfortable, which is a, always a tricky thing when you go to record. You want to you want to feel comfortable with who you're around. And I was like, you know what? If I'm going to feel comfortable with that guy, I want to feel comfortable with everyone I'm working with. I want to bring. This was sort of like my equivalent of like, this is my last hurrah, if this was gonna be. And I'm like, I wanna bring all the people that I really enjoyed playing with over the years. I wanna pick a few of my favorite songs. Money is Better Heaven is one of them. That's circling back to the point. And I wanna write some new songs. I wanna have it kind of be an equal mix, like maybe about half and half. And once I just gave myself the um, permission to have fun, we had a lot of fun. We had so much fun and I had so, I had the 
and I've had great times recording in other situations too, don't get me wrong, but I had the most fun I've ever had recording on this album. And then now I want to make another one. I'm waiting for this Good. whole COVID thing to end. And Good. I'm like, just let me get, let me get out of here. Like, let me go back to the studio. You just needed to let yourself off the hook. You just I did. needed. And I'm glad. I, I'm glad. I think you absolutely should go back in when this this mess uh, subsides. I think you should do more. Thanks. Uh, follow your heart, bro. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, well, it's like you know, you, you start realizing like you you know, it's like you're not getting any younger. If you want to do something, do it. If you're not, then stop talking about it. And I wanted to do it, and I did it, and then now I feel totally re-energized all, all 2020 nonsense aside again like my favorite moment of this year was that show we played in february like it was me brett on drums but for fred Figura, and uh, my longtime friend and longtime musical companion anthony barkoviak on bass and then a cavalcade of musicians that i just ringers i brought in my buddy marco palillo my buddy steve asham this this guy i had just met maxwell who played saxophone i never had saxophone it all felt perfect and i was like this is going to be my year. <laughs> and then the kick in the nuts. Then the kick in the nuts. Then the kick in the nuts. So the title track, Bad Ideas. Uh, I, I hate when you use such coarse language. Uh, you talk about what a swell, a swell guy you can be. Yeah, yeah really, really. Uh, it's like Dan Doherty stepped out of 1938. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I had, uh, I had my, uh, my, my letter jacket on. And that was... I was going to get a uh, a, a soda. <laughs> I, I love using old timey language. I, I think it's really fun. Um, and I remember when I presented that song to the, the group, uh, the drummer Brett, it was like that was that was the line he liked the most. That I, <laughs> I was using some like old like Archie and gang and the gang. Yeah, I, I said 1938. Really, it's like 1956. Let's let's share a soda together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, there. I, you are a good lyricist. I, I love the line from the same song. If you're gonna let me know what you think of me, even if it ain't kind, it's nice to know I've been crossing your mind. I love that. Thanks. That, 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 that defines the song. Um, going back to money, uh, it's just you and all your pennies waiting for a train to come on follow that man. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't even have a debit card at this point. It's just a, <laughs> the bag, bag of coins. It's a troubling time now because we are running out of coins too. So, like, my song is even more relevant. <laughs> uh, there's a song on the album that's it's kind of an outlier. It's really the noisiest song on the album, and that's "Try It Again." Yeah, tell me about that one. That uh, yeah, I'm glad you said that. And it is an outlier. It's a total um, experimental song on the on the album. Uh, it is. It was a song that I knew how to start and I didn't know how to finish, and. I want it's, it's like a Stephen King book. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was. So that song was us like really reaching and being ambitious. We brought out a lot of uh, instrumentation that we would normally use. Um, but it's let me just set up a couple things that I my, my observations about that song, what I liked about it. But one thing was um, I tend to be kind of lyric heavy when I when I write songs, I have a lot of a lot of lyrics in some cases, arguably too much in some cases. And I really wanted to strip it down to like something really primal and, and resonant. And um, and then I wanted to just blow it out. Like I wanted to make sure it, it followed none of my normal song structure, which, you know, like, I, you know, I usually have repeating choruses like everybody else. This, this does not follow that structure. It's more of a call and response. It has one weird break in the middle um and then i wanted to get really weird with it like brett brought this out of me the drummer again he's a he's a guy who loves to get weird with it like he's like what if we put this in there what if we put that in there and i and rather than playing it safe i was like yes let us do let you bring out the giant bass drums you can hear like these elephant drums clanging yeah, yeah. in there and then we brought like a dozen kids in to sing in the background and like another dozen adults to sing in the background for the call and response section at the end. And what's wild about this song is that it was one of those songs where I was like, if it doesn't work, I just, I'll just cut it from the album. Like I'm willing to cut. I got, we, we actually did cut two songs that didn't make it. Um, and when we recorded it, there was a really great drum track, but it was longer than I thought. So I rewrote the ending. 
and the ending ended up being better than what I thought my original ending was. And so I felt so good about the, just the, not only the collaboration, but the willingness to put myself out there that I'm like, this, this track is staying in, even though I know it defies a lot of what my traditional expectations for my songs would be. I love it. I, a lot of drama, uh, more emotion. Drama is the wrong word. Emotion on the song Ready to Play. Uh, there are some strings on there, too. Yeah, well, well it's, it's simulated, but yes, yeah. Um, String sounds. Yeah, it's, uh, it, they're really good. They got uh, Steve Asham did the, um, the string pieces for that. And, uh, Love it. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a song about, um, about my wife and I. I've written a song about her back when we were young puppy lovers, and now I wrote a song about her and I as a couple that's been together for some time and just been through some stuff. So it was a, it was a same feeling, but different perspective. I, I like following your life story. I, I, I think I saw that puppy love develop in the Beardo strip and now I can hear it develop and ready to play. <laughs> it all comes yeah. full circle. I, I love it. Uh, again, the new album right here. It's bad ideas. That's Dan Doherty. Uh, before I let you go, uh, you know, one question I ask every artist who's on uh, during this time, how can we support you? Commissions, like buy your, buy your music. What, what can we do to keep Dan Doherty moving forward in this time? Good question. And I, you know, and I, that's, I think that's a really important part about right now. I mean, I, I've been, I've been grateful and, and lucky and fortunate um, that I have a really good fan base um, that has been reaching out to me because all of our conventions have gone away for now, yeah. which is a huge source of income for a lot of artists. Um, and a lot of publishers are kind of like pencils down right now until things calm down. Um, so it, you do, I, I, I want to say this as a blanket statement. It's good to go straight to the artist if you can. If you can reach out to them in some way, whether it's me or whoever, it's really a good idea to say, hey, look, I'm a fan. I wanted to see you at something, whether it was a gig or a convention or a, a signing or appearance, whatever. If you're not going to be there, you know, where, where, where to go? So that's a fantastic question. I want to just really put a punctuation on that. For me, you could do a couple things. I, I have my website, beardocomics.com. Beardo Comics is all one word. And it's got all my books. It's got the album on there um, on vinyl and download. And the vinyl comes with the download too. So if you want the best of both worlds, you can get that. Um, and I also, like we mentioned before with Beardo, um, I did a Patreon for that, which is a, a great resource for a lot of artists to have their, their fans directly finance their work and in turn allow them to make more work i mean i'm one of those it. people who um gives everything i've got into um what my fans give me you know like i i have a really great fan base like i said so my patreon is patreon.com backslash beardo comics and i post new beardo strips three times a week with blog commentary video processes if you want to watch how i draw and learn what i actually do um, you can check those out and then, um, and then old classic strips, classic, uh, <laughs> 10, 10 years ago, I guess it's classic, that is. Um, you know, but it's like, I, I give that, I give, I give a lot of love to that thing. And I, I even have a postcard glove for people if they want to get, um, actually here's one of the postcards. It's, it's me riding a horse into traffic. Um, <laughs> so I, <laughs> I like to have fun with stuff and I, I do it because it's my reaction to how serious everything else is. So if you see me saying something funny or making something funny, trust me, it's in a reaction to everything else going around. And that's, that's how I treat the world. I, I'm um, right there with you. I, I'm, I, I, I get overwhelmed by social media. I get overwhelmed by the news. I, I go through a range of emotions sometimes over the course of 30 minutes and that approach it's kind of the way i've treated the podcast more or less i, I like that we, we need the distraction we need good fun distraction from this yep i'm a firm believer of the show must go on you know and i think that it's it, even if it even if you're not feeling it that day you got to find a way to reconnect because it's when you make something you're you might be helping somebody else but certainly i feel like you get something out of it knowing that you did something that someone else cared about. And I think that to me, it selfishly is a, is a really powerful thing. I agree. And I, you know, with the podcast, I realize there might be episodes that not a lot of people will listen to, or not a lot of people will watch, but I like 
just knowing that I'm doing this every night. I, I like just pr- putting that out in the world that something's kind of normal out there. Like yeah. I'm, I'm doing content every night. I don't know if people will be along for the ride every time, but I, I like just having that in people's heads that somewhere there, there's something that's not all this going on. There's a comfort in that. There's a yeah. comfort that even when you, you're not always caught up, you know, there's, there's, there's people who I, I dearly love and respect and worship and, and adore their work. And sometimes I fall off the wagon with them and I, or whatever on the wagon, I forget how it goes, but like, I, I don't, I, it's been a while since I caught up with them. And then one yeah. day I, I need that moment and they're there for me, you know? Right. And I think that that's, I think I, I, again, I applaud you for what you're doing because you're there for people whenever they want to tune in and stop by. I think that that's important. Yeah. The light's always on. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> All right. So beard, beardocomics.com for more of you. And it, like, it is a rabbit hole. Once you start going down the, the Dan Doherty, I'm going to use another metaphor track. Uh, there's just so much to discover just artistically, the storytelling, the music, so much going on. Uh, the most recent thing of course, is this album right here. Uh, if you're a fan of rock and roll, if you're a fan of melody, if you're a fan of lyrics, bad ideas, there you go. Can I, can I mention one last thing? Is it okay? You can, you can mention as many things as you want. We have nothing but time. I got, I got one of my proudest moments happened this year and I, I want to talk about it really quick because, um, we were supposed to go on this massive book tour and it did not happen. Um, so probably one of the, I, I feel like one of the greatest accomplishments um, I've, I've had happened this year during this pandemic, which is that um, this book, A Thousand Knows, um, which is a children's book that I illustrated with uh, author DJ Gorgian, um, was released. We had this wonderful stuff planned um, we were supposed to be in the Bologna uh, uh, Children's Art Fair uh, Festival. We were supposed to be doing all this stuff. And then um, some of that didn't happen, but we pivoted. And what I, I just want to mention really quick is that it's a book about rejection. It's a book about dealing with uh, like perseverance and dealing with hearing no, de- de- dealing with um, things not going your way, but then realizing that that's actually a gift because it leads you to a stronger yes. Um, so... What was really cool about this was that, um, yeah, yeah. So that's exactly it. Barnes and Noble loved it so much. They made it a 30 day exclusive in July. And we actually, at one point were number one on the, on the children's book uh, list on the top 100. How great, how great is that? It was, I, I, I gotta say it. Cause like, if I don't say it, I mean, who knows if this year <laughs> when I'll get to say it next. So yeah, it was a really wonderful thing. It's still a wonderful thing. It's still happening right now. So it's it's still exclusive at Barnes and Noble, but it's going to be available all across every platform you can possibly think of, like Target, everything in August. And um, and this is a culmination of 16 years of friendship, collaboration, and hard work with DJ and I. So um, I, I can't I can't let you go without saying that. <laughs> and, and nor should you. I, I love it. Yeah. It's fantastic. All right, Dan, thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm going to stop the Facebook Live. Thank you, everybody, for watching there. Much appreciated.